again, the, the, the book that we're looking at is Understanding Creation, and uh, we're discussing the question, how, do we how can we interpret the first chapters of Genesis? Um, the book is uh, written by James Gibson, or edited by James Gibson and Umberto Rossi. There are 20 chapters that are designed as questions. They're supposed to stand alone, although every once in a while you'll see uh, references to other uh, questions. I'm kind of, now that I uh, see this chapter, I am kind of uh, wish I had uh, known about it while I was writing because it would have been nice to refer to it in my chapter because uh, um, the anchor deals with some important questions that uh, can be uh, uh, problematic for people who are looking at the biblical record. Uh, there were supposed to be 1,800 or 2,400 words, and Randy is one of the few people I think that actually kept within that uh, that uh, range. Um, and uh, for those of, uh, I, I will say that he writes one of the best chapters in the book, in my opinion. Uh, he gives a concise overview of the uh, subject. He has references for those who need more than the overview provides, and he stays within his limits. And that's saying a lot. Now, he may have an easier chapter to write in that uh, saying the Bible means what it obviously looks like it means is a little bit easier. Although, to be fair, he, he uh, uh, there are those who make a case that uh, the Bible doesn't mean exactly that, or those who make the case that uh, that uh, uh, biblical writers really didn't know what they were talking about. And actually, he deals more with that than the question of what the chapter meant. Um, I do think it is an important one. I think it's foundational. Uh, uh, and uh, we'll go into that further. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Randy Yonker uh, holds a BA and MA in religion and biology. He actually had a biology degree from Pacific Union College, MA and PhD in Near Eastern Archaeology from the University of Arizona. That's where uh, Bill Deaver is, who used to be in uh, a foe of biblical archaeology and has turned around in the last few years. Um, Randy serves as professor of Old Testament and Biblical Archaeology at the Adventist Seminary, uh, where he's also director of the Institute of Archaeology and the Siegfried Horn Museum. Uh, Dr. Yonker has directed numerous interdisciplinary seasons of archaeological field research in Israel and especially in Jordan, and is a trustee of the American Schools of Oriental Research. So he's fairly high up in that regard. He's co-edited seven books and has published scores of scholarly articles. Obviously, they're not all listed here. Um, and he begins his, um, his chapter with the, um, uh, the statement that some of the more, most controversial chapters in the Bible are the first 11 chapters of Genesis. Many scientists have argued that everything in the universe, including planet Earth and life on it, came about by purely natural means. And of course, that's what makes it the con uh, controversial. That God had nothing to do with its origins. And that's important to remember, is that, is that the background of a certain variety of science says that God may or may not exist, but he's certainly unemployed if he does. Um, <clears throat> most scientists today believe this. Uh, small, a slim majority, by the way, but uh, but there's it is a majority. In direct contrast, the first eleven chapters of Genesis assert that God, by the mere power of His spoken word, created everything: sun, moon, stars, this planet, and all life on it. And that kind of sets. The background, and as we're going to see, the people who challenge the biblical record, by and large, have trouble uh, with science itself. Um, the key challenge to the Genesis claim comes as a result of the scientific study of nature, what is referred to as God's second book. As modern scientists have studied the Earth, particularly through the disciplines of geology and paleontology, they've observed phenomena in the layers of the 
or its crust that they interpret as requiring millions of years to form. A very well constructed sentence says exactly what he wants to say, no more, no less. Uh, in addition, science, scientists have noticed a sequence of fossils in the geologic column that they suggest show changes or change or evolution from, that should be from, that's my typo, simple life forms to more complex modern ones. Finally, as scientists have studied certain radioactive elements in the geologic strata, they have seen that the lowest rocks seem to be very old, some hundreds of millions of years, and that the upper layers gradually show less age. And then he puts in parenthesis, which I think is important in this regard, it should be remembered that most scientists work within a worldview that rejects the idea of God a priori. Before reaching any conclusion whatsoever, so that the explanation for all phenomena encountered are interpreted within a purely naturalistic philosophy. Uh, upon putting these observations together, the large number of thick strata, fossil sequence, and radiometric dating, the scientists have concluded that the Earth and life on it took millions of years to form. This broadly accepted conclusion contradicts the common understanding of the biblical account of origins. God created life on the Earth and the world by uh, the power of his sp spoken word in six literal days only a few thousand years ago. He then moves on to discuss the, um, uh, what do you do when you accept this view of science? Influence of modern scientific concepts on biblical scholars. Since the 1880s, many biblical scholars have been strongly influenced by the findings of science in the areas of geology and paleontology, as well as by the naturalistic philosophy for understanding the world in a manner that removes God from the picture. These scholars have concluded, I mean, if you start out knowing that science is correct in this regard, uh, then the Bible has to be basically explained away. Um, these scholars have concluded that the Bible should likewise be viewed through a naturalistic lens, thus disregarding scripture's own description of the revelation inspiration process. They do not study it as a book of divine origin, but rather consider it a book of purely human origin. Consequently, the Bible is viewed or understood as unreliable since humans are clearly capable of making mistakes. Furthermore, I, I, he, he doesn't add, but I think it's probably fair to say that the Bible is viewed as making a bunch of obvious mistakes. Um, and uh, not just clearly capable of making mistakes, but they've made obvious mistakes. For these scholars, the fact that the Bible was composed in antiquity before the advent of modern science makes it even more likely that the Bible's description of origins is erroneous. In view of this critical understanding of the Bible, biblical historical critics proposed an alternate process by which the Bible came into existence. Uh, the alternate to what's described in the Bible itself. This alternate process denied, excuse me, the Bible's self-claim of supernatural origin replacing it with the view that text was outcome of a purely natural human process. In the case of Genesis, scholars suggested that the book was not written by Moses under inspiration sometime before 1450 BC. Rather, Genesis was written and edited by a number of unnamed authors, often referred to as J, E, and P. And if you're curious as to where D dis, uh, was, Genesis wasn't written by D, that was Deuteronomy and redactors over a period of several centuries, between 1100 and 450 BC. Scholars who promote this view, often referred to as historical critics, have offered several lines of evidence for their reconstruction of Genesis. They point to phenomena in the Genesis text, such as the apparent doublets, contradictions, and anachronisms in an attempt to show the complex diachronic manner in which Genesis was composed. The identification of these purported phenomena in the text have led them to suggest, for example, that Genesis 1 and 2 pre present contradictory creation accounts written in different times and for different purposes. And by the way, some who claim to accept the record have said uh, the, that they, what the, the author was trying to do was to propose something that couldn't possibly be true, so you, you were supposed to know on the face of it 
that it wasn't to be taken literally. Their rejection of the supernatural manifested in the world has also led these critics to reject any supernatural or miraculous claims in the Bible, such as the idea that God could create the earth and its life forms merely by speaking, and that this occurred over the course of only six days. The critics prefer to accept the conclusions reached by the bulk of contemporary science, that the earth and its life forms came into existence through purely natural, uh, natural processes over millions of years. Also rejected is the idea that the entire surface of the earth as we know it was destroyed by a divinely initiated flood. For them, no global flood occurred. And if there was any flood at all, it was only local in nature. The biblical critics also argue that the creation account in Genesis is full of naive ideas that prove the account cannot be historically true or scientifically plausible. For example, they claim the Hebrews possessed a naive cosmology an unscientific understanding of the structure of the universe. Pulling together different biblical texts and making some assumptions about what neighboring ancient Near Eastern peoples thought, the biblical critics constructed what they thought the Hebrews would have actually believed about the nature of the universe. In this reconstructed Hebrew cosmos, the heavens were seen to be a ho like a hollow upside down metal bowl resting over a flat earth with the sun, moon, and stars fixed to the underside of the dome where they could be seen by humans at night. The dome was also thought to have gates allowing for the occasional flow of water, rain, from the waters above the heavens. The critics also assumed that the ancient Hebrews believed in large subterranean seas and a literal hell. Uh, that was at one point all fairly much boilerplate. It's been challenged and, and uh, Randy uh, give some of the challenges to that uh, kind of picture, um, responding to critical arguments. Each of the arguments put forth by the historical critics for the non-inspired alternate origin of Genesis has been thoroughly critiqued by biblical scholars who reject the historical critical method. Now, that doesn't mean they re reject historical criticism in general. That means they reject a historical critical method that starts with the removal of the supernatural For example, careful analysis of the word for day, yom, in the creation account shows that it does not mean an indefinite period of time, but rather a literal day of about 24 hours, such as we know today. And the reference to that, of course, is Hazel's article in Origins. Thanks, uh, Dr. Roth. Um, <clears throat> If somebody were to show that, that the days back then were 24 hours and 10 minutes, or 25 hours, or 23 hours and 50 minutes, I don't think anybody's losing sleep over it. We're talking about days where the Earth revolves, and they're approximately the same length as today. If the flood, for example, had disturbed the length of the day, that's not the kind of thing that we're particularly worried about. And I think that he's, again, being very careful of what he's saying and what he's not saying. Um, in fact, I understand that we're losing leap seconds periodically and that uh, with the Japan earthquake, the Earth's rotation speeded up slightly. So we're not exactly 24 hours ourselves right now. I mean, within a second, so it's close enough, but, you know, the point is not the exact length of the day. The point is that it has days where the Earth revolves. If you like to put it that way, they're evening morning days. Thus, the Bible does indeed state that God created the world in six days and rested on the seventh. Similarly, an analysis of the Hebrew word for flood, mabul, shows it to be a unique word for a global water catastrophe leading to the literal destruction of the entire world, a decreation of the work God had executed during creation week. As for the idea that the Hebrews had a naive view of the cosmos, recent studies of the Hebrew word for firmament so it does not mean an upside down metal bowl. And um, he has references, uh, Matthews for uh, two, Newman for three, and we'll come to Russell and Grant for four. Indeed, a review of the history of critical biblical scholarship shows that the 19th century scholars 
that shows that 19th century scholars were the inventors of the belief that the ancient peoples, Hebrews and others, conceived of a flat earth with a metallic half dome sky. Fascinating. Now basically, it comes out of the war of science with religion um, and uh, that kind of uh, a, uh, a picture. And it really doesn't come from a careful uh, reading of the, uh, of the ancient documents themselves. It made a good story, it got picked up, and it's kind of lived on its own, very much like the idea that the Earth is the center of the universe, which is the greatest place to be. Uh, which, in fact, if you look at the, uh, the ancient cosmology, and this is pretty clear because I, you know, it carried out into the medieval world, uh, you had uh, the Earth, yes, indeed, being the center of the universe, but the world, the Earth has four s substances instead of just one, which is less perfect. Uh, the quintessence was what the sun was made of, and it was unchanging, and that's really good. And um, that sin was only on the Earth, um, I guess having been kicked out of heaven before, I didn't think that went through too much. Uh, but most importantly, if you really want to get to the center, the center of the universe is hell, and that definitely is not the best place to be. So, uh, actually, uh, when uh, uh, Copernicus said that the Earth was not the center of the universe, um, he was actually elevating the Earth rather than uh, decreasing it. But you will still find people today using that old story uh, that the Earth is the center of the universe and that um, somehow Copernicus dethroned us. The ancients really knew better. Other challenges concerning the unity and antiquity of the creation flood account have also been addressed. For example, the presence of doublets. That, for example, two different names for God, Elohim and Yahweh, and the telling of the creation story twice in Genesis 1 and 2 have been shown to be a common narrative technique in ancient Near Eastern literature and thus does not necessarily reflect the existence of more than one author. And um, he has references to both of those uh, notes, Kitchen and uh, Kikawada. Um, apparent contradictions such, and I'm sure that they meant to say and and uh, somehow the, uh, or, or as I should say, uh, whether plants were created in day four of creation week, Genesis 1, or were not added until after creation week was finished, Genesis 2, have not been convincingly explained. In the example mentioned, the Hebrew words for plants in chapter 1 are different from those used in chapter 2. Uh, the plants created on day 4 in chapter 1 are like those of fruit trees suitable for food. In contrast, the plants found in chapter 2 include thorns and thistles, uh, that's my misspelling, I think. Or certain grass-like plants requiring considerable work to bring to harvest. The context of chapter 2 clearly shows the second group of plants came about as a result of sin. And the interesting th thing is that that's been known since the time of Umberto Casuto. And people just have kind of not looked at it very carefully. Uh, finally, the appearance of so-called anachronisms in Genesis. For example, the appearance of tents and camels in the second millennium BC have, has been shown in many cases not to be anachronisms at all. Renowned Egyptologist and scholar Dr. Kenneth Kitchen has shown that uh, tents were common in the ancient Near East in the second millennium, just as the Bible describes, and he actually has uh, also reference to Hoffmeyer in that note. Uh, similarly, the presence of camels prior to the time of David has been well documented in recent times. Uh, by uh, Kitchen makes that point. I had the privilege of contributing to this conclusion upon discovering an ancient petroglyph, a rock carving, of a man leading a camel by a rope in a Bronze Age context before 1400 BC north of the traditional location of Mount Sinai in the Wadi Nasib. So uh, Randy's actually seen this with his own eyes. Uh, there's stuff there that uh, puts camels way before when 
they were officially supposed to have been uh, done, you would have been better off trusting the Bible on that than you would have the uh, uh, scholarly consensus, shall we say. Uh, significant literary features of Genesis, uh, he makes a note of uh, uh, a number of features uh, are, that are more typical of the second millennium before the Christian era than the first, suggesting that much of Genesis reflects earlier times. For example, several second millennium primeval histories exist, origin stories such as the Akkadian Atrahasis epic and the Sumerian Eridu Genesis with which Genesis 1 through 11 has much in common. Among these features, uh, another glitch by the editors, uh, is a clear organization by parts. All three of these primary, uh, primeval history stories contain three sections, a creation story, a rise of a problem, and a judgment by flood. This is the, uh, did we do that? Yeah, this is the same paragraph. It's just too long to all put in, I think, if I remember. While ancient Mesopotamian cultures produced later flood stories like the Gilgamesh ep epic and creation stories like the Enuma Elish, these later versions were no longer complete primeval histories containing all three elements, creation, problem, flood. The fact that all three exist in Genesis would indicate that Genesis was composed at the same time as its Mesopotamian counterparts in the second millennium. That fits with the biblical view that Moses wrote the book of Genesis sometime before 1400 BC. Of course, the Genesis version is significantly different from its Mesopotamian counterparts. In fact, several <coughs> scholars have noted that the author of Genesis was deliberately challenging the Mesopotamian version by being polemical. And interestingly, his reference to that is, uh, is a piece by Gerhard Hazel in the, I believe it's the Evangelist, uh, Evangelical Quarterly. Um, that is, the author of Genesis was disagreeing with the Mesopotamian version of creation and was claiming to provide the correct version of how things came into being. It is worth noting that a number of literary features in Genesis 1 to 11 suggest the, author's intent, uh, the author intended to pro provide a historical narrative of Earth's early history, not simply a theological statement or non-literary non-literal, literary depiction of creation, such as a poem, parable, saga, myth, etc. For example, a unity of the narrative of Genesis 1 through 11 continues into the rest of Genesis, and indeed runs into the book of Exodus. Together, these books tell a continuous story from creation through Abraham, Joseph, the descent down to Egypt, and the Exodus. In fact, the creation story of Genesis 1 to 11 has been identified by many scholars as a prologue to the rest of the Pentateuch. Um, in fact, uh, that's probably the consensus view, in spite of uh, uh, in spite of uh, the digested forms that you might read sometimes. Second, a certain Hebrew verbal form exists, the while consecutive, that is typically used for historical narratives, such as is found in the books like the Chronicles and Kings. The while consecutive is, fa is found in the creation count as well. And uh, uh, Stephen Boyd does an interesting statistical analysis and shows that 70% of the verbs are while consecutive, which is actually in the higher range of what you see in uh, uh, narrative history. Suggesting historical intent and purpose for the narrative. A third literary feature clearly points to the historical impulse of these chapters. The appearance of Toledoth formulae, usually translated as these are the generations of. Finally, many elements in ancient Near Eastern parallels of primeval histories can be shown to be historical. And he has references to that as well. And this is his summary, and this is actually the last slide from him. Uh, taken together, this evidence suggests that it remains eminently reasonable to conclude that one, Genesis is in fact an early literary work, the product of the second millennium before the Christian era. Two, the text was composed as a unified account, although there may have been some minor editorial work at a later time. And three, the text was intended to be understood by its authors as an authentic account of Earth's origin in which the world was created in six days and later destroyed in a global flood. Now, 
Just my own take, uh, Yonker has done one of the best jobs of staying within the original space limits while still covering the subject. He's done this by the judicious use of footnotes and by short summaries of the subject. And the questions he deals with are relevant. Uh, just this year, another book has come out repeating some of the claims that he re refutes. Uh, there are broadly three types of biblical commentators. Those who take the Bible as it reads and believe it. Those who want to believe the Bible but also want to believe science as they understand it, which is the current scientific consensus, and then try to reinterpret the Bible as compatible with this science. And uh, basically they kind of have to reinterpret the Bible to make it uh, uh, make sense uh, to be able to fit it into uh, the standard scientific model. And uh, it's the old round peg in a square hole thing that we've talked about in the Exodus. Um, and finally, those who see the Bible as a discredited competitor to the science, and those people are quite happy to admit that the Bible intended to cre convey a creation account. Some of them go a little further and are willing to try to make the Bible sound like it really didn't know what it was talking about here and here and here as well. In other words, uh, they tend to make it um, uh, less than is justified. A, um, uh, a book of naive people who really didn't know anything about uh, modern cosmology, uh, modern science in general, and uh, the, the strictures that natural law puts on uh, uh, on history, and so, you know, of course they believed in miracles because they were too stupid not to, or too stupid to not believe in. Uh, Yonker deals with both of the latter groups. Um, I think mainly group three, uh, in my chapter I dealt a little bit more with those of, of uh, two. Um, and. Uh, with that, I'm going to allow uh, comments and questions from the... Anybody? Uh, let's see. We'll just uh, turn the lights back on. And I have a comment here and then one there. Um, what do we do about our Adventist people who for whatever reason feel, hmm, how should I say, seduced intellectually into thinking that the Bible isn't worthy of their trust. Um, I think that what we have to do is the same as what we would do for uh, people who are not, uh, uh, who don't intellectually believe the Bible is worthy of their trust, who are not Adventists. Um, that is, I think we have to meet them uh, where they are with their understandings. And we have to engage them in uh, ways that they can understand. Um, now, I suppose there's a further political question of, uh, uh, you know, should these people be allowed to teach? Uh, I think that some of that has to be done uh, by voting with our feet in a certain sense. And possibly voting with our pocketbooks. Um, but dealing with people who are in positions of authority who, uh, who feel this way is a much stickier question uh, than simply how we deal with it in general. I, I still think that we have to be very, very careful in whatever we do uh, to uh, to have the emphasis on the intellectual question rather than power politics. Uh, I do think, though, that uh, where power politics has made the issue, 
that insofar as we are able, we need to put our foot down and put a stop to it. And you know, one, of the, one of the ways of, of doing power politics is to, uh, uh, to pretend not to. <laughs> and the, but that's, that's uh, one of the things I'm trying to do right now is to keep it at the intellectual level rather than moving in towards there because uh, because I think once we devolve into the other one, uh, it turns into a might makes right problem. Yeah, power doesn't solve anything. That's it, right. It doesn't clear up any convictions anywhere. All it does is it makes some people into losers and some other people into winners, apparently, but eventually when the dust settles, everybody is losing. A man convinced against as well is of the same opinion still. That's right. And, so. and I would go further than that in saying that the, uh, the mark of the beast can be taken in the forehead or in the hand. The devil doesn't really care. That's right. The seal of God can only be in the forehead. That's right. I have uh, several uh, comments. One is regarding the creation of the sun, the moon, and the stars on the fourth day. I would like to suggest a new idea. I haven't read this anywhere. That Moses, on purpose, put the creation of the sun, the moon, and the stars on the fourth day because at that time, people were worshiping the sun, the moon, and the stars. So he wanted to relegate, put it, uh, in other words, to give glory to the creator and a minimum amount of glory or credit to the sun, the moon, and the stars. Second, regarding the metal dome, if I understand correctly, birds were supposed to fly in that metal dome. How do you explain that? Well. And, and the last, regarding the flat earth idea. I was reading the other day uh, quotations from Augustine referring to a round earth instead of a flat earth. Now, if Augustine believed in a round earth, how can we say that the Bible teaches a flat earth? Well, I'd be, I'd be a little bit cautious about that last point uh, because Augustine had some trouble with the literal meaning of Genesis uh, because it conflicted with his philosophy and so he had the idea that it all happened at once but it was told in seven stages or something like that because a God who created plants and then uh, for one day, the, or for two days actually, the earth would be imperfect without animals. And uh, so God just wouldn't do things like that, so he did it all at once. Um, that's clearly a platonic philosophy, and apparently God is quite happy to make things that from some kind of theoretical standpoint might be considered imperfect. Uh, we probably should be thankful for that ourselves. Uh, <laughs> but um, <coughs> uh, but the fact of the matter is Augustine was not alone on this. Uh, you really have to hunt to find anybody that says the earth was flat that was Christian. I think there are two people that they dig up all the time. And the reason that they're always the same two people is because they're the only people. Everybody else conceded a round world. That was common knowledge. And this is one of the mistakes that uh, the 19th century anti-religion uh, scientists, Andrew Dickinson White, and I forget the other guy's name, um, uh, who you know, wrote The Warfare of Science with Christianity. Um, uh, there's a couple of titles that are basically the same, have the same idea. Um, really got into uh, popular opinion, you know, and 
uh, they relied on the church in Galileo. Well, the church in Galileo's time certainly had conceded, uh, if you want to put it that way, uh, was teaching, if you, is really more accurate, that the world was round and it was approximately 24,000 miles around. Which, you know, considering it's 24,700, it's not a bad estimate. Um, and, and so it's not just Augustine, it's the entire uh, community. And the fact of the matter is that some of this stuff has just been made up out of what's basically whole cloth. Uh, people decided that, that science was against religion because the church hated Galileo and, the, and, uh, and um, Darwin was disapproved by the church and uh, therefore it fit a narrative and uh, like a lot of people who want to fit narratives, they didn't pay <coughs> sufficient attention to the exceptions and the problems with those narratives. I think the other person you're trying to think about is Draper. Yes, I think <coughs> you're right. Who was uh, director of the, the medical school, New York Medical School for a while. A very famous scientist and so on. Uh, uh, but, and produced a book that was very popular, along with Andrew Dickinson's wife's, uh, book. And the, these two books did an awful lot to, to establish science as uh, a secular entity on its own, excluding God, uh, per se. And they both relied on flat earth argument and things that were marginal in uh, authenticity uh, to do this. Uh, but their ideas caught on, and the flatter of argument got spread over all encyclopedias and all kinds of things. They're correcting it now because it, people are realizing that this uh, is a fake, and that uh, most, hardly anyone ever has ever believed in the flat earth. Yeah, I'd like is this on. It's supposed to be. Hold it close. Okay, now you can hear me. Yeah, I want to comment on my good friend Randy. Um, we actually started our doctoral program together at Andrews, and he was uh, not, he was somewhat into archaeology, and he was taking some theology then. So he has a background in studying Hebrew and Hebrew language, and I think he took a class in Hebrew. Then he went into archaeology at University of Arizona. Um, I differ with my friend on the Rakia interpretation from this standpoint that linguistically it's a noun based on a verb and as you know a lot of Hebrew nouns are based on verbs that's you have to go to the verb to try and decipher them the verb simply means to stretch or to beat thin and there are some cases in ancient languages not just Hebrew where that similar verb uh, refers to a beaten plate of metal, and that's how they form their metal, you know, into objects, even mirrors in ancient times. So it could be um, either way, or it, it could mean uh, to stretch a piece of cloth. And we have texts in the Psalms and Spread Jeremiah. Out the, tent, the heavens like a tent. Yeah, I stretch out the heavens like a tent, or like a garment. Psalm 104 speaks of light being a garment. Well, light is part of the heavenly uh, dome there. So you could go either way. I, I think Randy's trying to make an airtight case that it doesn't refer to beaten metal. I don't think you can rule it out. But these are figures of speech, and to base a cosmology on figures of speech is another challenge. Well, you just so mentioned another figure of speech, light. Light, yeah. Is like? A garment. A garment. Yeah. Uh, I mean, nobody that I know of, ancient or modern, has thought of light as something that you can like put on. And yeah. uh, so, obviously, there there are levels of abstraction, even with the ancients. Except when we deal with Adam and Eve, we speak of the garment of light. So, uh, it, to be fair, that's a 19th century. <laughs> that is 19th century, and it's in Ellen White, I think, too. So. Now, another point I'd like to hear some discussion on, and that's the idea of a three-storied uh, universe that Randy does discuss somewhat. But 
um, you know, there are three levels. And uh, the Bible speaks about the heavens and the earth and the seas, or the heavens, the earth, and then the waters below. There's a lot of texts that are three levels, and scholars have debated whether there's three or four, because you could have heavens, earth, seas, and then the waters below the seas. You could actually have another realm, the realm of the netherworld sea. So you seem to have vertically in the biblical mind three levels. And now with the new studies done on the temple and the sanctuary and so on being a prototype of the whole cosmos, what scholars are saying, you have the three sections of the wilderness tabernacle as well as Solomon's temple. You have the most holy place, you have the holy place, and you have the courtyard or the area around the structure. And so William Brown is one of the first scholars, evangelical theologian, who uh, suggests that you can take the vertical dimensions of the Old Testament and apply them to the horizontal dimensions of the sanctuary. And you have tripartite, three sections. I attended a conference where he was a presenter last June and uh, talked to him afterwards. And I said, well, did you get that from John Walton, Lost World of Genesis? He said, no, I wrote my manuscript before Walton's book ever came out. He didn't know about Walton then. But what we're finding is there is this idea of temple, tabernacle, and cosmos. And I just wish Randy had gone into that more. Dick Davidson at Andrews is going into that with Genesis 2. He's done a lot of work on Genesis 2 being having tabernacle in imagery. And as you know, I presented on the topic mm -hmm. here too. So. But what do you think of the idea of three levels being symbolized in three horizontal sections of the tabernacle? Just a question for everyone to think about. Well, we have a comment back behind. Um, well, you do have, you know, experientially, where we live, um, there's, uh, we live on land, if you go down far enough, you go to sea level, and if you go uh, uh, further than that, you're into the water. And so for, for the way we live, it's, it's the heavens, the earth, and the seas, which are technically under the earth in that sense. Now, whether there was an original creation with subterranean water is hard to say. Um, unfortunately, we don't have access to that world anymore, uh, except as little bits and broken pieces of it. Um, uh, what we have now is a, almost, you could say, a new creation and certainly inferior to the old one. Um, but uh, I, I think the division uh, in, in that sense is a natural one. And the thought that's being conveyed, for example, in the Ten Commandments, uh, heaven and earth, and the seas is basically the totality of our terrestrial experience. Cosmos. The cosmos. Uh, the only the only place where the ev anything outside the solar system is referred to, and even then, I'm not sure, uh, is uh, the kind of the throwaway line at the end of day four. He made the stars also, or as the Hebrew would put it, and the stars. And it, that may even actually be and with the stars. There's some dispute over what at means in that particular regard. Um, but I, th I don't think that Moses would disagree with the idea that God made the stars 
either. In fact, I think he'd strongly agree, and he would have put it there. And that may be why it's there, is because it's where the thematic stuff is. Uh, when God says, he said, too many, two great lights, and the greater light, and then the lesser light, and then sort of like, um, oh yeah, don't forget the stars. He made them too. Uh, I, I think that that's the picture that you have, and I'm not sure that you can pin uh, this, uh, the stars to creation. I especially don't, I'm not sure that you can pin the stars to creation at the fourth day. Uh, when uh, Job talks about the foundations of the earth and all the morning stars sang together, implying that the morning stars were already there at the foundation of the earth, uh, which presumably would be first day. Um, but I think that the theme that would be there is that God made everything, number one. And number two, the stuff that we deal with on a day-to-day on -day basis is, was made in six days. Uh, yeah, I, there, there are persistent, uh, and in fact, it's, it's almost comical when you think about it, the, the, uh, the reproduction of drawings that were made by people who were trying to ridicule a belief that they believed the ancients had, where the, you come down to the edge of the dome and then you can peek out and see what's outside of it. Um, and, and if you think about it, that's, that's putting somebody's caricature of somebody else's belief as a firm piece of data. And uh, that's not the way one would normally do uh, historiography. And it certainly is not the way one would normally do science. Uh, comment here, right. and then we've got a couple of more here. The uh, morning stars is sometimes interpreted as angels uh, or other beings in the universe uh, when they sang, you know, cause I guess because angels can sing more than stars can. Uh, that's, that's, you know, that's uh, another view of that, uh, of the morning stars sang together. Uh, I, I might add, Randy has written an extent. He and uh, Dick Davidson have written an extensive article on this thing. It's not published yet on the Rakia uh, issue. Not published yet. Uh, I think they lean towards uh, the idea that it, it's not a hard dome, for sure, but. It's uh, it's something uh, special. Uh, as I recall, that that's that's kind of the interpretation they're leaning towards. Uh, uh, well, it's interesting to note that Jesus talks about the wind. That it you know comes where it goes and uh, you know goes where it wants to, and you can't see it, but you can feel the effects. Mm -hmm. And so it's real, even though it's invisible, if, you, if I can put it that way. And I think that it's important to realize that the ancients saw that as well. And actually, if you're trying to describe something that's real but very thin, uh, rakia may not be a bad verb to do that. Now, I agree with you that, uh, that if you want really hard to say, but you haven't quite proved that it isn't a thin beaten dome. Well, no, but you rarely get to prove that kind of thing anyway. And you, what you want to do is you want to take, in general, the most natural explanation. And the most natural explanation is not those stupid ancients they just didn't understand. And they believed in this hard dome that anybody with, in his mm -hmm. right mind wouldn't believe in. That's not the way you'd normally do historiography. You'd assume that people are relatively rational until proven otherwise rather than the reverse. And this is really what's happening is the people who take this are on a mission to discredit the biblical record as being something from a bygone age that really didn't understand 
and therefore every chance they get, if there's two ways of looking at things, they look at it the hard way because it fits the agenda. It was done at the beginning by Andrew Dickinson White, who had way less information than his conclusions. You know, he, he and, and, and now that we have more information, it's obvious that he made several wrong choices in that regard. Um, and this is not the procedure that is best designed to find the truth. And so I think that if you can show that it's reasonably interpreted either way, and that one way makes more sense, that the logical thing to do is to say, take it in a more sensible way. I have a question. As I read the Bible, I discovered that every time a prophet he had a vision, he claimed, he made a claim to that vision. He documented the, file, the fact that the information he is sharing with us came through a vision, a direct revelation from God. But when I get to look I found a different type of inspiration. He makes no claim to a vision. He says specifically, I did some research, and here's the result of my research. Now, my question, why is it, and I ask this question many times in different situations, in different Sabbath schools, which I attend, <laughs> and nobody has, except you, I think, Nobody has acknowledged that this might be the case. And is it, why is it that Moses did not claim the, uh, the story, the two stories of creation, as the result of a vision? Could it be that it followed the look and model of inspiration, which is research in the uh, libraries of Egypt, or maybe research among his relatives, those who uh, you know, had the, this story in the well, In fact, there's a, there's a distinct possibility that God told, might as well be Adam and Eve, this is the way I created the world. I started this, and then this, and then this, and then this. And if you want to know why it's so highly polished, it's not because the priestly code people figured out how to make it completely uh, uh, bereft of any... Uh, 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 references to idols or anything like that is because when God tells you a story, it's a good story. And, uh, and uh, I mean, most people who have read it will concede that in terms of how it's presented, it's presented in a way which is just really very good in terms of its, uh, in terms of its literary style. And then Adam tells the story as he understands it. You see, he wasn't around for the first six days. So he begins with a world in which, you know, God told him how he was made. And then the rest of it he sees. Now God had planted a vineyard, a, 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 a garden, which is the epitome of, of uh, you know, what you really want. I mean, in, in, ancient Egypt, in ancient Israel, everybody was under his own vine and under his own fig tree. Because vines and fig trees don't take all that much work. As contrasted with, for example, grain. But you have to plow the field and you have to sow the stuff, you have to take out the weeds. Um, constant work and then finally when you get done you have the, uh, you have the stuff. Mm -hmm. The vine just grows over the weeds, there's no problem. And uh, the weeds are easily distinguished from the vine. Once, once the garden get, gets going, it's really nice to have. And, uh, you know, m my grandparents in Washington State used to have a fruit orchard. And they had to add everything, pears and plums and currants. And it was a wonderful place to be. And, as, you know, as kids, we'd go out there and just, you know, eat to our heart's content. Um, uh, uh, when, when the fruit season was on, 
uh, I can't think of any place else I'd rather be. Uh, if, if you're out in Washington State some other time, so there's salmon berries everywhere. Uh, you know, this kind of a thing where the fruit is just there for the picking and uh, uh, that's the kind of thing that it, a king would have. It's the kind of thing that a god would give to a subject whom he really wanted to honor. And then, and, and the whole picture of, you know, there was not this yet and not that yet. Uh, those, are, those are plants that you have to cultivate and those are really nasty weeds. Uh, and those were the things that were not there yet. And that's the point that, God, that Adam was making. And God planted this for him and God brought the animals to him. And he's not really that concerned with the, the, with the time frame of exactly when they were made and all that. He's more concerned with what, uh, you know, what is happening to him. And God is showing him that, you know, these are all nice to have, but a dog is just not a substitute for a woman. Um, and then when he's fully appreciative of what he's lacking, uh, God makes a woman from his side uh, so that he understands that he's supposed to be equal to her, not above, not below. I mean, there's a lot of symbolic stuff that's going on that, that God is impressing upon Adam. And when they get done, they're as happy a couple as you've ever seen. Then the story goes on. This is an account by somebody who was actually there, who was human. And since Adam lived almost a thousand years, that means he told the story to generations after generation until to his grand, 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 whatever. It may have even been more specific than that. If you read the stories of Toledoth, there is a good argument that can be made that, that these are actually had been reduced to tablets by the time of Moses. And so Moses didn't have to do a lot of editorial work, he just simply write what's on the tablet. Mm -hmm. And this is the tablet of so-and-so, and this is the tablet of so-and-so. There was no need for a vision. There, was, there may have not been need for a vision in that particular mm -hmm. case. But you see, that's happened all over the place in the Bible. If you read, um, if you read uh, Joshua, the story of the, the sun stood still, and he says, hey, this is written in the book of Jasher. You know, and you go down, and this is written in the book of the Wars of the Lord. And you go down to the Kings and Chronicles stories, and he says, and you know, you can look at the Chronicles of, of King Asa, and there, there you'll find this stuff. So this is ancient records of sighting people. This, this is ancient records of sighting. The people who joke about um, uh, the reason why God is not tenured at any university is because, one, he only wrote one uh, work, two, it was in Hebrew, three, it had no references, are wrong at least in part three. <laughs> oh, the, the other thing is that when, uh, when one of his subjects went awry, he drowned all the, uh, one of his experiments went awry, he drowned all the subjects. Uh, <laughs> he sent his son to teach the class. Uh, there's, there's a list of about 13 different things that people put in that. Uh, uh, Ariel, and then uh, I wonder if uh, you know Sanford's data, which has been substantiated. Although uh, I'm speaking about the rates of mutation for mm -hmm. each new person, he he talks about a hundred, maybe two hundred per person per new baby that's born. I think and there's a dispute on that. It's now down to sixty. It's 60. But now they, 60 is still bad enough. They did an actual count, yeah, 60, you know, and that's uh, what about uh, 20 times bigger than we thought about 10 years ago. Yeah. Uh, about three. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm wondering if we, if we extrapolate that back into the past, uh, how degenerate are we uh, compared, I mean, <laughs> You're putting a lot of mutations in there, uh, and maybe we have reason to think that maybe these uh, ancient had better memories than we have, and uh, 
we uh, don't relate as well. You know, everything has to be done on paper and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. didn't have to, maybe it didn't have to be because uh, they didn't have as many mutations. Uh, this big load of mutations that we have, of course, you know, makes it almost impossible for, for the human genome to have survived very long. Uh, well, you know, there are, are times and places, especially where you don't have written records, where people agree, they handshake, and they say it in front of some witnesses, and that's it. And y <coughs> you are expected at that point to keep your word. What was the contract? That was the, that was the, con the concept of the mm -hmm. contract. I mean, nowadays we have it written down so that you can check and see if it's a signature and stuff. But, <coughs> but back then, it was, that was it. And then, uh, you know, as time got on and people got better at lying and making sure the witnesses disappeared. Um, uh, then you had things like uh, <coughs> rings that people owned, and yep, that's my impression, which is basically the same thing as putting a signature on. Um, and what it boils down to is <coughs> that if people are not going to be honest, it's a huge problem, and there's nothing you can do to really make that happen. And it's interesting, I was just reading Polybius uh, this morning, I think it was. It was either this morning or last night. I think it was this morning because I didn't read that much last night, uh, where I uh, was too busy making this, um, where Polybius says, you know, there's a difference between the Greek uh, statesman and the Roman statesman. He says, a Greek statesman, you, you hand him a talent and it'll disappear. And the Roman statesman, you hand him a talent and it'll still be there. And why? It's because the Roman thinks that the gods are looking after him. The Greeks have gotten over that. <laughs> Interesting perspective. I, I would add just one little caveat here, and that is, uh, I think as a person matures, uh, their memory gets to be more and more selective, and uh, this this is something we, we all need to take seriously. And and we need to be <laughs> very careful to fight against as much as we can. Yes. I'd like to comment further on Rakia. Um, Randy does not go into the book of Ezekiel to decipher what rakia firmament might mean. Uh, I think one reason he doesn't is Ezekiel has a lot of uh, symbolisms and he would like to take Genesis 1 uh, literally. In, Gen in Ezekiel 1.26, part of a vision, Ezekiel says, and above the firmament, over their heads was the likeness of a throne in appearance like a sapphire stone. And on the likeness of the throne was the likeness with the appearance of a man high above it. And that man is son of man or Christ, a divine being. Um, firmament over their heads. So that places it above us spatially. But then on top of the firmament, so to speak, is a throne, God's throne. Now, if you look at sanctuary imagery, the throne is linked with the Ark of the Covenant. And so you have most holy place, heavens above, then you have the Ark, and then you have the Rakia, and then you have the earth down below. To me, it makes a lot of sense. I know Leonard raised the question, does this have meaning? I think it had meaning to ancient people, and we've got to do a little more homework, perhaps reconstructing what it meant, not only to ancient Israelites, but to people in neighboring cultures. And that's one thing John Walton is, has done and is doing, and that should get us to thinking about potential there. <clears throat> Before we uh, go on, I'm going to make two observations. One of them is it's a little after uh, 11.30, and the second one is that I have some visitors from out of town, so I'm going to probably close this in about five minutes, but I think we have one comment over here. came across an interesting photo of a cylinder seal, and it had been carved, and it was a very ancient cylinder seal, and it was very fascinating because it would be rolled on wet, some type of wet clay, and then hardened. And that gave the impression for, you know, like a signature. And it had on it not only a throne with somebody sitting on the throne, but attendants on either side. And all around it, as it rolled, 
Here are these pictures of different fruits and animals and plants. It was a very, very intricate cylinder seal that was fascinating, all the things that had been imprinted on that, making it extremely difficult for somebody to try to uh, make a copy of. And, and that, of course, was part of the function, was, uh, you know, if you did everything but you left out the little animals on the side, why, uh, no, sorry, that's not my seal, because my seal is animals. I suspect it was probably a king's seal. Uh, it might have been. It might have been. Did we have a... And uh, some of the cylinder seals have uh, uh, pictures of trees, sacred trees, and there's probably a connection with the tree of life and tree of knowledge of good and evil. You know, we have to be careful, though, and I, I'm aware of this, that you're drawing dotted lines all the time when you're comparing ancient culture and their depiction of things and what's in the Bible. And then you're drawing a dotted line when you have a symbol in the Bible, like Ezekiel, and then you go back to a created reality in Genesis 1, which is more literal. Yeah. Uh, there you have to be cautious, too. You no, know, it's interesting. If you read that, you, it raises a question of whether he's, what he's, when Ezekiel says it like the likeness of a son of man, like, it yeah. almost makes you wonder whether this is, you know, above their heads, this is hologram. Uh, and how would you say that in Hebrew, you know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, obviously, the word hologram is A, Greek, and B, uh, modern. Um, so uh, certainly the meaning that we put into it is modern. Yeah, and the word like is in the Hebrew, so it's doing a comparison. Like a sapphire. Sapphire is blue, and we could extrapolate from there that we have a blue dome over our heads. So you may have a connection there. I don't know. But these are all dotted lines, and they tend to point in a certain direction. Well, like I say, you can picture it if you stop uh, looking at it as hard metal. Right. Which and I've you, done. And you, and you start looking at it as uh, maybe they're talking about something that's not, you know, kind of thin. Uh, that there's this thin blue stuff over them and, mm -hmm. there's, um, and there's something that looks like a man. But you know, it's not enough like a man to be able to say it's a man. It just looks like one. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise it would say... Uh, like Daniel says, the Son of Man came, and he doesn't say some, well, he does say somebody like the Son of Man. He does say like he does the like. Son of Man. That's so he, right. does, he does give you, again, the implication that it's not quite what it seems or could not, you know, you can't be quite so sure. But you have, uh, but you have the Ancient of Days who's enthroned, and he just says the Ancient of Days. He doesn't mm -hmm. argue about it looks like the Ancient of Days, you know, it's just it's there. And the angels are the same way. It's just protect, uh, projected as an angel. Um, but this is something that, he, that they, want, they don't want to say quite it exactly is, that it, it looks like the form of a man, but it's, it isn't quite, you know, something's different yeah. about it. Good. And, and uh, you know, when we have that kind of picture, I think we need to be really, really careful about trying to extrapolate too vigorously because they're trying to tell you right there that they're doing the best they can to describe it in the words that they have. Right. Good. Anyway, uh, next week we will have somebody and it'll be in the, uh, uh, in the announcements and if any of you aren't getting the, the, uh, uh, the emails, why, uh, let me know and we'll uh, fix that for you. Uh, but uh, one, of, one of us, uh, it'll either be me or probably Elaine Kennedy or possibly Leonard Brand if he's, uh, uh, if he's available that week. Uh, but uh, somebody will be here tomorrow or n next week. In uh, I, I'm sorry, you're right, you're right. No, no, uh, Ariel Roth is next week. And then, I, and then the week after is the one that, uh, that, we'll, have, that we'll fill somehow. That is correct. It's Ariel Roth uh, next week.